What is not understood by people mostly is the fact that women have coronary artery disease and they die of coronary artery disease much more than they die of cancer. 20 crore women suffer from coronary artery disease in our country. But clearly the most important test which is missed is that of an MRI. And the MRI can tell you a lot. You can come to coronary causes, you can come to non-coronary causes. You may have Thank you, Dr. Pelajani. Thank you, Ajit, Dr. Satyawan Sharma, Akshay, uh, and all of those who invited me over here. Uh, this is a, a topic, I think, which is uh, very important because when we talk of a condition like Minoka, we're actually encompassing a very broad kind of spectrum where people may have coronary artery disease or may not have coronary artery disease. And that is what we really need to know. We need to understand that this is a condition in which you may be talking actually of pulmonary embolism on one side, you may be talking about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on the other side, and you may not be having anything to do with the coronary arteries and just the troponins are elevated. So I think it's quite an important uh, kind of situation. What is not understood by people mostly is the fact that women have coronary artery disease and they die of coronary artery disease much more than they die of cancer. It's always thought that uh, people, women are dying of cancer, but if you look at breast cancer, you look at uterine cancer, you look at coronary artery disease, it's totally different. Coronary artery disease is the biggest killer. One in three women die of that. And in fact, if you look at it, in the United States, 400,000 women's lives are lost each year because of heart disease or stroke. The prevalence may be slightly different, but still 20 crore women suffer from coronary artery disease in our country. And if you were to look at the risk factors, you would see that women have a little more hypertension, have more diabetes when they have coronary artery disease. So not the fact that they present a little later, as Akshay had pointed out, but the fact that if you have risk factors, they are going to present as early. And one more risk factor, which I think I need to add to what he said, is the consumption of oral contraceptive agents. In fact, they lose much of their protection if they smoke and they use oral contraceptive agents. And I think that's important to keep in mind. This is once again the international uh, lookout to say that myocardial infarction occurs at 64 in men and 17 women. It's uh, I think a decade earlier in our country. But the important fact to state is that medical attention to women, especially in our country, is extremely poor. You would often see a woman not getting an, a PAMI. You would often see a woman not receiving thrombolysis. And you would often see misdiagnosis in women. So the impact is much more because in women you see many more complications. You would see patients who go into heart failure much more frequently in the female sex than in the male sex. You would see uh, cardiomyopathies much more frequently and obesity, though it's a risk factor in men, it's a bigger risk factor in females. Smoking is a bigger risk factor. If women smoke, they have more disease. It appears that the pathophysiology is different. In fact, if you do CT coronary angios in these patients, you would see that women have smaller diameter vessels. Uh, they're less likely sometimes to have obstructive coronary artery disease. But it's important to realize that in spite of the fact that they have uh, not, so, not so much of obstructive coronary artery disease, the fact that many of us misinterpret that when we do an angiogram and they come out with non-obstructive or they come out with normal coronary arteries, we tend not to investigate them any further. We get them back into the cath lab sometimes three years later, four years later with the same symptoms, do the same angiogram then and do not do anything further than the same angiogram and then we continue to re un not to realize these women have a high risk of morbidity and mortality and that's what I need to really concentrate on. Akshay had already pointed this out that if a diabetic is a woman then she has a seven times greater risk. Men may have two, three, two to three fold. Similarly if they smoke they have a much bigger risk than men have. After the fifth decade of life, you would see that, you know, cholesterol levels because of the, men, uh, the menopausal kind of symptoms, cholesterol levels equal out. And in fact, you would see more obstructive coronary artery disease in the older women. You would in fact see more diffuse disease in these people and certain things like triglycerides, LP little a, in fact become even more predictive of disease in these people. Uh, though premature coronary artery disease in a first degree relative of a female is certainly much more important than a male first degree relative. So if a woman has her mother 
or if a woman has a sister suffering from coronary artery disease that is highly more predictive and there is in fact another test that all of us must keep in mind just because you get a negative stress test but if the METs that they cover is hardly five then you must realize that these people are at a higher risk of mortality than one who covers eight or nine METs that's important whether they have ST segment changes, whether they have chest pain, that's not important. If a six minute test, walk test, or if a stress test is done and the woman cannot walk for five minutes, that's a bad prognosis. Autoimmune disease must also be considered quite commonly in female, SLE. SLE causes a very high risk of a myocardial infarction, more in a woman than in a man and a higher risk of mortality. Now this fourth universal definition of myocardial infarction needs to be touched upon. The important fact is to remember that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is all common. What is different is that in one you have obstructive or non-obstructive disease. The pathophysiology will be the same whether it be erosion of the plaque or whether it be rupture of the plaque. But whether it causes non-obstructive disease or it causes obstructive disease is what it divides into 1A or 1B. But what we must all realize that in all these situations that we talk about the symptoms have to be there non-ischemic ECG, new ischemic ECG changes, similarly imaging or one of these. Not the enzyme elevation alone because if you get enzyme elevation alone, it may be a non-coronary event. There is where the diagnosis of Minoka actually differs. And what we must also look at is what is a type 2 MI where we talk about a difference between supply and demand. Very often the patient may be having a hypertension or a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, atrial fibrillation, pulmonary embolism and you will have an elevation of the enzymes. You'll also have ongoing chest pain. Now, do you label this as myocardial infarction or not? According to the fact that you have elevation of enzymes, you have chest pain, you will label it as a minoka if you do an angiogram. After you, you only call it minoka after you have the specific diagnosis of uh, angiography having been done. Now, this is what ischemic heart disease gets covered into. One is the stable coronary artery syndromes and the acute coronary artery syndromes. And when you have it as a non-obstructive situation, you may either have an infarct or a non-infarct. And if you have an inoka, it's basically without the infarct and if minoka is with the infarct. This is a very important slide actually. It shows you in about five, this was, this was published I think from in the Indian Heart Journal and it shows you that in a good percentage of women, that means in almost about 20% of women overall, they would have non-obstructive. Young women, almost about, if you look at obstructive is only about 35%, whereas non-obstructive is much, is much larger. Elderly women, the opposite. But very important to say is that you will find a large number of women who have either non-obstructive or normal coronary arteries. And the further investigation of these people is extremely important. It's also clear that when you have an infarct, the, the territory of distribution is usually in the LAD. Left main is quite small, but LAD is the most common artery to be affected. Now, what is the ESC uh, position on this? The diagnosis of Minoka is made. It's a broad-based diagnosis, you must remember. It has to fit the universal criteria of acute myocardial infarction. There should be non-obstructive coronary artery disease and no clinically overt specific cause for the acute presentation. This being said, Minoka with non-coronary artery, with non-obstructive coronary arteries would be seen in about 6% of all AMI patients. In the US alone, almost about 50,000 to 150,000 would report with this. Uh, it accounts for about 20% of, of type 1 MIs, more frequently seen in younger and in women, more likely to present with NSTEMI, less likely to undergo PCI, so on and so forth. Now, what we need to look at, and this slide once again points out to you, that it's not a benign condition. Look at mortality at two years. Mortality at two years for obstructive coronary artery disease is in the range of about 8%, whereas for Minoka, it's in the range of about 4.6%. So it's not a benign condition. This is very important to understand because we tend to sometimes not treat these patients adequately. We tend not to follow them up. As you can see in the next slide, you look at a patient who's come to you, a 55-year-old woman, clearly the diagnosis of an acute myocardial infarction, non-obstructive coronary disease, no apparent cause for presentation, send her home after you've done everything. That is the problem I think we must this thing. So what's next?
what should we do, what should happen, and the thing is that we should treat it analogous to heart failure. Further evaluation regarding the underlying mechanisms, just not leaving that patient alone. So here's what we need to think. These are the possible situations. You could have plaque disruption, you could have vasospasm, you could have spontaneous dissection, you could have thromboembolism, microvascular dysfunction, and supply demand mismatch. So you must in your mind bring yourself to think that you will have one of these conditions and you need to touch upon them. What is a very important area which we miss I think in our, uh, you know, in our situation is not to do an MRI in many of these patients. I think we fail many of our patients by not doing a cardiac MRI. But there are other situations. If you strongly feel that this patient has got a thromboembolism, for example, she's had somewhere else an embolism in the, in the leg, then you must do the thrombophilia screen. You must. Similarly, you may have to do intravascular imaging. You may have to do intravascular imaging to pick up non-obstructive lesions which you think are there. Or you may have to do provocative testing where you think there's an evidence for coronary artery spasm. But clearly, the most important test which is missed is that of an MRI. And the MRI can tell you a lot. You can come to coronary causes, you can come to non-coronary causes. You may have vasospastic, coronary microvascular disorder, plaque disruption, and in the non-coronary causes, very often you may miss a myocarditis. Uh, Takosubo is picked up quite often by echo. Other cardiomyopathies, the squid syndrome is also there. We picked up a patient of squid, squid, squid syndrome the other day, where classically you have the basal segments which are uh, not contracting and the apical are contracting. So you have those kind of situations. Very often the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism goes away. Renal impairment where you think that, you know, patients' troponin levels are very high, creatinine 4. These are the patients whom you may have also missed in that particular kind of situation. So the etiology of, of Minoka is, is, has to be looked at from non-coronary and coronary causes. Increased right heart pressures, for example, pulmonary embolism, structural heart disease, myocarditis, microvascular dysfunction, thrombophilia, all of these must be looked into. It's a key investigation, as I mentioned, that CR imaging may pick up for you, for example, the echo may be normal, but you will pick up very often a subendocardial infarct. You have a minor lesion here like this in the LAD, and if you do a MRI in this patient, you will see that this patient has a subendocardial infarct, and you then get the diagnosis of this being an event. The troponin was elevated, minor lesion in the LAD, patient has had an event. So we need to go further. For example, Minoka is very heterogeneous. It's, a, it's just a working diagnosis. You may have AMI as the cause, uh, myocarditis, a dilated cardiomyopathy, so on and so forth. And here are where we can look. 40% are because of plaque disruption. Another 14% thrombophilia. Uh, maybe because of uh, you know, positive pro pro provocative test in a, a good number of patients. Those with a microvascular spasm and 20% may have SCAD, as Akshay had talked upon. Young women, especially in the pregnancy situation, may develop spontaneous coronary artery dissections, and these also must be looked at. We had a patient in that time when I was in Holy Spirit Hospital who pre presented to us with SCAD. She was pregnant, she had, uh, she had SCAD, she had an infarct, and she's following up now. And it's important to understand that these are the patients that also need to be treated. From the 27 large registries that we can see out over here, we could see that uh, the, uh, the incidence of, uh, of, of epicardial causes is, is important in the diagnosis of, of Minoka. Uh, you have the, the coronary vasospasm may need to be picked up by provocative testing, as I have already pointed out to you, and I won't go into details of that, but in a certain group of patients, we need to do that. Uh, coronary dissection, SCAD needs to be picked up, most probably by IVIS or by OCT. Uh, coronary thromboembolism may occur from various uh, sites like the valvular vegetations, cardiac tumors, iatrogenic air emboli. Sometimes when you're doing an angiogram or an angioplasty, you may cause an infarction. Uh, microvascular disease needs to be looked, looked at. We very often misunderstand microvascular disease. What we are looking at are the epicardial vessels, which are only 5% of the circulation. We have to look beyond the epicardial vessels and realize that very often we may be dealing with my microvascular spasm, 
uh, nicorandal sometimes is the treatment of choice in these patients and that may help in, in microvascular spasm and help for these particular situations. The treatment options differ depending upon what you really come about. For example, if you had in, uh, you know, intravascular imaging and showed you a myocardial infarction, you may have to do PCI. On the other hand, if you have coronary dissection, it may be a conservative line of treatment for spasm, uh, calcium antagonists, so on and so forth. Uh, other, other treatments. So it's not a benign condition as you can see in this particular slide. The in-hospital mortality for Minoka may go up to the extent of 1.1% and at 12 months it may be up to 3.5%. So this condition has to be looked at more seriously than we have looked at it so far. Uh, coronary dissection can be a cause as I pointed out and we have spoken about it already. Who gets it? Who gets these, 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 these CADs? It's undiagnosed as you said in number of patients but you can see that the causes, causes of SCAD are seen more often in, in women, uh, it's seen in younger people, it's seen in patients who are pregnant and, and these are the various conditions where you must look at, at, at SCAD as their causes. You can see recurrent pregnancies, fibromuscular dysplasia, uh, systemic inflammation and one of the precipitating stresses which I must uh, clearly tell you is intense exercise. Uh, people go in for marathons, people go in for heavy weight lifting. These are the patients who can sometimes develop spontaneous coronary artery dissections. These are not traumatic dis dissections. Traumatic dissections in the aorta and the coronary arteries are different from what is the SCAD presentation of these, of these particular patients. They can present in different forms, they can present with a full infarct, they can present with unstable angina, they could present with cardiogenic shock, a cardiac arrest and even death. So it's not at all a benign condition and can occur, occur recurrently. Uh, you may need beta blockers for these particular patients, treatment of hypotension, uh, look at the uh, precipitating causes like emotional stress, psychological stress and they may have to avoid hormonal therapies, sympathomimetic drugs, so on and so forth. So in the end, I would like to say that uh, women and heart disease are different. The heart attack uh, symptoms may be, may be different, but may be even the same. Uh, you must look at uh, screening for them on a regular basis, get screened every year. Not just like they go for their pap smears and they go for their mammograms, they need to screen for heart disease also. Ask questions about your heart health. Remember that women die more commonly of, of heart disease than of cancer and it is the number one killer in the listing. The risk factors are clearly seen as menopausal, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, polycystic disease and these are the women at higher risk and should take greater care of themselves. Thank you very much for your attention. Insights from the world's best medical minds. You are watching the right doctors.com.